Ladies and gentlemen, it is a tradition of long standing here at the Nixon Foundation, particularly in this beautiful East Room, where, by the way, Ed and Tricia Nixon had their wedding reception, not in this room, but the real one at 1600 Pennsylvania. And they were married, of course, in the Rose Garden, which we have a facsimile of uh, right out those uh, windows in the Pat Nixon Rose Garden. But it's been a tradition here that we toast the President of the United States. Ron Walker, President of the Foundation, did it eloquently last night. Marie Nunn did it today to Pat Nixon. And we also toasted the, the uh, President by Gary Wilson, our Congressman, today. Tonight, I please ask you to welcome for that toast to the President of the United States, Ed Cox, his grandson. I mean, his, <laughs> his son-in-law. Maureen, you gave such a wonderful toast at lunch to Pat Nixon. And, um, you know, she and Mr. Nixon loved each other so much and were so close. And anyone who heard the private eulogy that he gave after her funeral services knew how much they meant to each other. And it was only 10 months later that he followed her. And at, that, at his services, um, uh, 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 the Senator Dole, uh, I think, defined uh, President Nixon's uh, uh, legacy in the best terms I've heard it defined. He said that the latter part of the 20th century would be forever the age of Nixon with respect to politics and diplomacy. And if you think of it from his case in the late 40s through his six crises as vice president, the way he redefined the vice presidency, and then the wilderness years when I met him, you know, when a man is alone and on his own without a vice presidential staff, without a presidential staff, that's when you see what he's really made of. And there is no doubt in my mind, I met him when I was a senior in high school, I knew him during that period, here was a great man. His energy, his fortitude, his character, his patriotism. But it's only in 1968, in February, when I saw the vision of what a great presidency he would have. And I was waiting for Tricia to change in 810 Fifth Avenue in his library. He came back, and this was the New Hampshire primary was coming up. And the big question was, what was Nixon's secret plan for peace in the world and in Vietnam? And I had the temerity to ask him. And he replied, very simply, I'm going to Peking, and I'm going to Moscow. And that's the way we'll bring peace in Vietnam and in the world. Think how extraordinary that statement was in 19, February of 1968. And he went on to be a great president, as all of you who attended the forum this afternoon, and all the things that we talked about China and a little bit about the Soviet Union, a lot about the domestic programs. There's so much more. Marlene Malik, you mentioned the war on cancer. And then Jeff Donfeld, you mentioned to me about the, about the, uh, the drug program he was, which he put in place, which was really historic, and on and on. It was a great presidency. But then in August of, of 74, those dark days, and I remembered he was on his own again. And he showed his greatness as a man. Uh, when I worked with him on the night of August 9th on the remarks he had made to his staff, which were just under those conditions of what he said and the way he said it. It was really extraordinary. And then we went off and got in Marine One and we were going by the Washington Monument. And uh, I was thinking of, here is a great man and there are cycles in these things. And frankly, I wanted to say something was positive. I said, in 10 years, I said the president were sitting across from each other. I said, in 10 years, this will turn around and you will be back. And sure enough, 10 years later, on the cover of Newsweek magazine, by order of, of the publisher, who was the publisher of the Washington Post, also Catherine Graham, there he was. He's back. President Nixon was back 10 years later. And, and he, showed, he showed his greatness in doing it. 
Frank, you remember the memoirs, those years in San Clemente when he wrote his memoirs? And then he wrote The, uh, the Real War, which was uh, candidate Reagan's uh, defined his foreign policy and his, his first foreign policy as president. And then I remember traveling with him in Eastern Europe and he picked up, there's, things are changing. Things are changing in the Soviet empire. And he quickly did a new book called Real Peace, uh, which said we need diplomacy as well as confrontation. And you could see the Reagan foreign policy change. And so it went throughout those, those years when he was a sage in Saddle River. And even in, I, I remember when I was sitting with him in his study, uh, two months before he died. And uh, he had just gotten back from Russia and he got a call from President Clinton in 1994, March of 1994. And, uh, and, and he always felt that communism had lost, but democracy had not yet won in Russia. How pressing he was when you look at what Putin is doing now. And he was fighting to establish democracy in Russia as much as he had fought communism in the Soviet Union. And President Clinton wanted to get his advice. And in the, and in the months afterwards, I saw the foreign policy of President Clinton with respect to Russia change the way President Nixon suggested. So here was a great man and a great president. And I want to give a toast to a great man, a great president, a great American, Richard Milhouse Nixon.